All right, welcome back, beautiful students. Now that we finished uh, the part one of the Odyssey, which is all about Odysseus's adventures on his way home, now we're going to begin part two, which is the homecoming. And this is one of the major themes in the piece um, is, you know, Odysseus's entire um, conflict was how to get home and getting home to his family and righting the wrongs um, that are occurring at his house while he's gone. And so that's what you're going to experience in this part too. And a good way to kind of bring yourself into thinking about um, the mood of the story is ask yourself this question, how does it feel to come home again? Uh, many of you have gone on small trips, whether it was for sporting events, maybe a retreat, um, maybe you went to go visit a family member or a friend, and you were out of your element for a while. And when you came home, literally think to yourself, how did I feel when I first got back to my house? And that's really going to help you think about the scene that you're about to read. Now, when it comes to the text analysis, right, this is something that we did in the beginning of the piece. You did a little worksheet that outlined um, different um, elements that you should be looking for. And again, right, an epic is a long adventure story. It's a long narrative, but it's told in a poetic format. Um, but this plot spans many years, right? And involves the long journey. Um, and so keep that in mind, right? That the setting, right, is the entire Mediterranean between what is present day Turkey and um, the Isles of Greece. And Odysseus has been blown all over the Mediterranean on his way home. But as we learn about his story, um, the epic themes or the focus of the entire piece keep popping up over and over again, right? We're looking at timeless concerns like courage, honor, life, and death, right? And all of this really does kind of contribute to this idea of being a leader or being a hero, okay? So again, as we're actively reading, right, we're going to annotate not only for the narrative aspects or the epic aspects, but we're also looking at these themes and how being a hero or the evidence or lack thereof of Odysseus's um, heroism contributes to these themes of courage, honor, life, and death. And through this, we really get to understand the ancient Greeks and what they valued. Um, we'll see some common archetypes or basically patterns found in works across different cultures and time periods. And what that means is basically something like good versus evil, right? We see this in almost every heroic adventure that's been um, written or actually played out in cinema. Um, so even though good versus evil can be found not only in the Odyssey and then stories of the Bible, but you see good versus evil in Harry Potter, in the Hunger Games. It's an archetypal conflict that you'll see no matter what culture you're reading about or what time period you're in. So as we're reading through the Odyssey, right, keep in mind we're looking at the intervention of the gods. Like how do they help or how do they hinder Odysseus? Um, looking at floods and storms, right? He already went into the underworld. He went to Hades, so he's been there, right? It's literally going to hell and back. That, that saying has merit in many adventure stories. And then, of course, these heroic battles against monsters, okay? So now as we're reading the second part, right, look for other archetypes that pop up um, and that'll help you with understanding the story a little bit better. Um, a reading strategy that they highlight here is summarizing, right? And so a good way to summarize is to kind of, you know, practice that spurs that we used to do, um, but also tassel. Um, what you want to do is you want to basically stop either at um, the end of sentences or the end of stanzas, which are paragraphs of poetry, and do a little summary for yourself if that's going to help you keep, with, keep up with the comprehension of the actual story. Now on the right here, you'll see an overview, and you'll notice that there's um, five books that we're going to be covering in part two. 
Book 16 and 17, we will actively read, um, but you do not need to pull um, actual evidence from these books for the next um, Evidence of a Hero worksheet. What you're going to be focusing on are these last three books looking for Odysseus's evidence of heroism or the lack of it. Okay. Before you start, you should preview these words, these vocabulary words, um, so it'll help you better understand how they're used in context. And with that said, we'll get to part two, the homecoming. Now, when you were to cite um, data from part two, um, similar to what you did with part one, you're going to give the part first and then a period, then the book that you're referring to, and then the line numbers. Okay, so keep that in mind. Notice the title, Father and Son, right? We're given a little summary here about what happens in books 13 to 15 and how Odysseus um, actually makes it home. And you'll notice here that Alcinous, after Odysseus has told him about his entire adventure, um, he actually helps Odysseus make his way home by giving him a boat. And when he gets home, Athena helps him, right? She disguises him, right? So he can actually go and visit um, a faithful servant of his, Eumaeus, who is a swine herder or basically a pig herder. Um, and even though Odysseus is disguised, Eumaeus really shows evidence of that Greek hospitality. He welcomes this disguised person who he does not know, um, gives him kind of like the daily gossip, right? Um, and meanwhile, while this is all happening, Athena again intervenes and tells his son Telemachus or Telemachus to make his way home from his adventure of trying to find his father. Um, she warns Telemachus that there is a plot out against his life um, and tells him to stay with Eumaeus for the night. And in this way, um, she unites both Odysseus and his son, Telemachus. They do not stay in the palace. They are on the outskirts with Eumaeus um, in his little shed. Okay. Now, as you again begin to read, right, again, look for those sentences and where they end and then practice the summarizing technique. It says, but there were two men in the mountain hut, Odysseus and the swineherd. At first light, blowing their fire up, they cooked their breakfast and sent their lads out, driving herds to root in this tall timber. When Tamal... Telemachus came, the wolvish troop of watchdogs only fawned on him as he advanced. Odysseus heard them go and heard the light crunch of a man's footfall, at which he turned quickly to say. And now notice, this was all narration by Homer. And now he's saying what's actually happening with Odysseus. He is telling the story. So here Odysseus speaks, Eumaeus, here is one of your crew come back, or maybe another friend. The dogs are out there snuffling belly down. Not one has even growled. I can hear footsteps. But before he finished, his tall son stood at the door. Dun, dun, dun. Now keep in mind, Odysseus hasn't seen his son in 20 years. And the swineherd, right, Eumaeus, at the sight of his prince, lets everything fall. And going forward, he kissed the young man's head, his eyes, his shining eyes, and both hands while his own tears brimmed and fell. So notice the reception that he gets from Eumaeus. Similar to when you come home and mom and dad haven't seen you in a while, right? Very, very happy. Here they use a very interesting um, epic simile. It says, think of a man whose dear and only son born to him in exile, reared with labor, has lived 10 years abroad and now returns. How would that man embrace his, his son? Just so the herdsman clapped his arms around Telemachus and covered him with kisses for he knew the lad had got away from death. So here we have a good example of an epic simile that describes how Telemachus and Eumaeus felt upon their um, 
they're reuniting. And you have to think of it here too. Odysseus is watching all of this and at the, you know, and realizes this is his son. And then you'll see how it plays out here. Okay. So this is the reuniting of Odysseus and his son. And after this story, we jump into book 17. And this is one of my favorite books. Um, just because it's talking about um, a nice symbol between a dog. His name is Argus and Odysseus and Ithaca. So when you read this story about Odysseus's dog Argus, think of Argus as a symbol for Ithaca and what has happened to Odysseus's kingdom as he's been gone. Okay. It's a very good example of how um, Homer uses um, extended metaphor in his piece. Um, so a nice poetic literary element. Now a lot happens between books 18 and 20, and you'll get a summary here. Uh, but basically we end up uh, back in Odysseus's kingdom in his great hall. And we'll learn about what the test of the bow um, is and what impact it has on the story. And um, here, in most notably in book 21, is we're introduced to Penelope, Odysseus's wife. And we get a lot of characterization of her through this story. So keep in mind, as you read, look for heroism, not only on Odysseus's part, but also his wife. It really, she encompasses what a female wife is revered as in the ancient Greek society. After the test of the bow, um, we have the final two books, Death in the Great Hall. This is a good foreshadow for what's going to happen in book 22, uh, but there's some great poetry, some great imagery, definitely some epic similes you should see and um, note as you're reading. Um, look for, you know, divine intervention on Odysseus's part, the help that he gets from the gods. Um, and then finally, after he has righted all the wrongs that the gods requested that he do, specifically Athena, we're left with the last book, The Trunk of the Olive Tree. Now keep in mind that olive trees or olives are the main export of the Mediterranean. And the olive tree is also um, a symbol of Athena. Um, and it's also a symbol for Odysseus. Think of this archetypal symbol of a tree. It serves as that connection between um, the mortal world or the world of humans and the immortal world of the gods and goddesses. And in this book, again, you're going to see some deep characterization, um, some examples of heroism or the lack of it. So make sure you note it as you're going through. When you're finished, you'll notice that this last page, 1266, is actually a poem entitled Penelope by Dorothy Parker. Um, this is just um, enrichment or reading that um, really just kind of shows how um, a theme um, can carry across the genres um, no matter what time or place. It can be an archetypal theme. And here, um, they really kind of highlight Penelope or the Greek woman um, of ancient times. Lastly, we've got some questions here. You do not need to complete these, but it's definitely a good review um, for the part two quiz, which you will complete after you complete the evidence of a hero uh, worksheet for part two. I hope that helps. If you have any questions, please email me um, and I'll try and clarify as best as I can.